around everybody and uh, we'll start just by asking each of our six, uh, five people um, to very briefly and in words that I can understand, tell us about what your job is. So in no particular order, we'll start with Allison. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Allison N. Feinberg. I'm um, speaking to you from Geneva, Switzerland. And my job, I'm currently overseeing an organization that is bringing together a number of different partner organizations from around the world to find the best ways to ensure that more people, particularly in low and middle income countries, have access to the wheelchairs, hearing aids, eyeglasses, prosthetics, and other similar products and services that they may need in their lives um, to live their lives to their full potential. Okay, and Alexa Durr? Hi everybody, I'm from Reinholds, Pennsylvania. I work for my family's non-ferrous recycling center. I've been there for seven years now, and I'm the advancement and operations manager. So basically I handle all of our inventory control for million plus pounds of uh, materials that we ship day in and day out and wear a lot of different hats there, plus training horses. Jessica Ratner. Um, hi, I'm Jessica. I work uh, for Nike. I work in Beaverton, Oregon at Nike's world headquarters, and I am a transition manager in global technology as a part of the global operations team. Um, basically, anytime anything tech related gets rolled out um, across the enterprise, it's part of my team's job to make sure that there's Good adoption that people are trained that we make sure that there's no disruption to the business fantastic and uh nicole gallant hi i'm nicole i'm originally from michigan but now live in the northern virginia area around dc um, so i work for northrop grumman space systems as a satellite systems engineer so i design build and then operate satellites cool <laughs> Uh, Nicole Del Giorno. Well, how do I follow that? Um, <laughs> I don't do anything exciting. I, I work in the marketing field. I'm a, a content strategist for an organization called MarketSmart. Um, and basically, we have a suite of software and online platforms that help nonprofit organizations or charities find big donors. Um, so I work with organizations like Girl Scouts and World Wildlife Fund and Mop Cancer Center. Um, and I basically make it so that their websites and their, their digital uh, platforms and the efforts that we produce for them are really easy for uh, potential donors and, and users to, to understand and to navigate. Nicole, I have no idea if there's anything you can do about it, but your lips don't match your voice. Is there something? Um, probably not because I'm, I'm joining from phone audio okay. uh, because my computer doesn't like Zoom. That's what I guess. Unfortunately, it might be a little funny. <laughs> That's fine. And Colleen Aiken. Hi, everyone. I'm Colleen Aiken. I'm originally from Connecticut and currently living in Houston, Texas. I work for Houston Methodist Hospital um, and I'm an outreach athletic trainer, um, which basically put simply, I manage athletes' injuries from everything from emergency medicine to like a paramedic would do. Um, to long cabin injury care, like a physical therapist. Um, I just work strictly with the athlete population. So on a typical day, I'm out at a high school covering sports, but my favorite part of my job is that I'm the Houston Methodist liaison and head of sports medicine for Rodeo what? Houston, which is one of the rodeos in the country. So Wait, that's my favorite part of my job. Wow. So one before we go which on, one thing I forgot to say, if everyone that isn't part of the group talking, if you can make sure you mute yourselves. And if you have any questions, you just go down to the bottom of the screen and click on the chat and you can type in a question. And as long as we have time, I will then pass on the questions to our panel. So um, if you, those of you not talking can mute yourselves and write a question whenever you need to. So each of you, what did you do as a young rider as far as your ex major experiences, major competitions? Um, and at that time, how important was your riding to you? We'll start with Alexa this time. 
Okay, so as a young rider, I participated in the WIT program. I competed on our Region 1 North American Young Rider team and Young Riders at Festival of Champions, Devon, Regionals, um, pretty much most of the major competitions on the East Coast. Uh, my Young Rider crew is very, very busy. I look back at my show records for those two years or three years and think, wow, that, <laughs> I don't know how I did it all uh, in the midst of high school and beginnings of college. Um, but riding was very, very important to me. Um, so was my education though. So I found a way to to make it work to keep both of those a priority. Fantastic. Uh, Jessica? Um, I was uh, very committed from an early age. I did the Junior Rider Team Championships, the Schumacher Clinics. I went to juniors. I was involved with USDF, ODS, TDF, USEF. I went on the TDF's uh, European Dream Trip. I uh, was a roving trainer and attended uh, London's festival one year. I worked for um, Beth Baumert and Gribbons, and I also worked for London. And uh, my family owns a large equestrian center and show facility out here in Oregon. And so eventually I came back and ran that and was a trainer until I left a couple years ago. Okay, and uh, Nicole, go on. Um, so I, didn't do some of the bigger competitions, but was very, very active uh, in a lot of lower level riding. Um, so I did the Great American Insurance Group Regional Championships. Um, I participated in WIT in the winter of 2015, um, participated in some of the uh, course mastership clinics put on by D4K, and then also did the equitation series. Okay. Uh, Nicole Del Giorno? Um, like a, a lot of the other speakers, I did the, the youth pipeline. So I started out, actually started out in Pony Club and 4-H um, and found D4K and that's how I got into dressage. So I went up through FEI Ponies, did the dressage and equitation finals, um, did uh, juniors and young riders um, and have, have done NAYC um, four times, national championships. Uh, participated, was fortunate enough to be, to go on the Dressage Foundation's Olympic um, Dream Program, um, was a working student for George Williams, and did some of the U25, just on the, on a recognized level, not, um, you know, not like for any of the national championships or anything like that. Um, I was actually set up with the help of Dressage for Kids with a really awesome working student position in Spain. Um, so, all throughout my young rider career, horses were were extremely important. I I wasn't um, terribly close to uh, you know a, a trainer locally, but as soon as I could drive, I was driving an hour and a half to to get to the barn and uh, would ride from sunup to sundown in the summer. So they were a really big part of my life. Fantastic. And Colleen. Uh, ever since I can remember, I was a working student, like literally <laughs> since I was six years old. Um, so I was a working student for every trainer um, I had until I was nine. And that's when I started working with London um, and was a working student on the weekends. So um, to say riding was everything is pretty much an understatement. Um, I was a working student then for my cousin, uh, Danielle Aiken, who I ended up being homeschooled for a while during high school. Um, and then uh, continued on in juniors and young riders. Um, I had a different path in the sense of I rode a, quite a few horses in that um, realm, just as I had a young horse that was coming up. So um, that was the main reason that um, I kind of bounced around a little bit. It was going to the horse opportunities while my horse grew up. Um, so I did the um, the equitation finals as well, um, which was really fun. I got silver and gold in that. So that was my main focus while I waited for my horse to grow up a little bit. Um, continued with uh, juniors and young riders when I was a working student for Vicki Hammers O'Neill. Um, and then similar to a lot of you, um, once I got to college, being a working student kind of fell off a little bit. Um, so I started working on an ambulance and just training with Vicki, um, which is when I started to get to focus on training my horse to Grand Prix. So um, I was all in um, when I was a high school kid. And then when I got to college, I balanced it a little bit. And Allison? 
Um, when I was a young writer, I was fortunate to do a lot of writing as well as teaching. Um, so I competed for the for Region 8 in the North American Young Rider Championships in 2001 and 2002 and two different horses. Um, I did the Region 8 Championships um, a few times. I rode in a lot of different clinics. I competed in one of the early um, youth dressage festivals. Um, I was a working student and assistant trainer at different times for Bill Warren and then for London. Um, I coached my college, college uh, dressage team and I became a USDF certified instructor as well while I was a, um, a young rider. Uh, this is, could be very quick or not quite so quick. Uh, during your teenage years, did you think you would become a, an equestrian professional? If so, what made you change your mind? Those that are not in the horse world at this time. Uh, we'll move down. We'll start with Jessica. Did you think you would become an equestrian professional and what changed your mind? Uh, no, uh, I definitely did not have it on the agenda. My family, you know, we had built our equestrian center at that point, but my mom was pretty adamant that she's like, you don't have to choose this path. And, you know, but I was riding and competing and um, I rode all the way through college. And then I came home and I, I thought, you know, I would go into the working world and that would kind of be the end of things. And then the opportunities arose. I went down and moved to Florida to work with Anne and then it just kind of became a thing. And I think partially for that reason that it just kind of became a thing is also part of the reason why I ended up leaving is because I didn't really make that choice. Um, it kind of happened. I won't say that anybody made it for me, but um, I think really taking ownership of my own life is part of what took me out of the equestrian world. And uh, Look, I, was, I was brief. <laughs> Good chest. Uh, Nicole, go on. Um, I actually really, really wanted to become a, a professional in the dressage world. Um, I thought it was absolutely the best job you could ever have. I mean, who doesn't want to ride all day? Um, <laughs> but as I, as I got more into the industry and um, got a little bit more information about the industry, both working as a working student and then spending some time down in Florida in WIT, um, I realized I I didn't want to do the business side of things. Um, absolutely. I'll ride horses all day long. Um, but the reality is if you're going to be a working professional, you're likely going to be an entrepreneur, a business owner. Um, and that's not a strength of mine and it's not an interest of mine. Um, so it really informed both um, not choosing a professional horse career as well as my current career path. Um, so I purposefully choose in my current career path to not be a customer interfacing a uh, position to really instead work behind the scenes on technology, um, just because that's not something that I enjoy. What what took you in the, you're, you have a degree in aeronautical engineering or something like that? Correct. So what, um, what made so you go in that direction? <laughs> I've, I've always been the horse engineering world. minded. Yeah, yeah. Um, Part of it comes from my family. I've always been engineering minded and very exposed to the engineering world. Um, and then as I was figuring out what kind of engineer I wanted to be, um, I realized I really like working with my hands. So I wanted to be hardware based. Um, and then I started thinking about the coolest things I could work on. And I was like, well, we'll just send stuff to space. Um, so my degree is in aerospace engineering. Um, I've worked on a variety of projects, both um, in school. So I've done research projects to understand um, heliophysics and trying to quantify some of the, the solar um, mass ejections that happen from the sun. Um, I realized that wasn't my thing. Um, I worked on the predator drones for a little while out in California in an internship. Um, realized that wasn't the, the location for me, and then have finally settled into the DC area working on satellites. Fantastic. Uh, Nicole Del Giorno? I'm telling you, you have to stop putting me after the other Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> Her story is so okay. much more interesting. I'll mix it up. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I saw it in my teenage years that I wanted to, and I actually do, I should have mentioned that in my intro, I, I do, uh, I am a professional equestrian, semi-professional uh, on the side. I have a small group of students that I can 
uh, I try to keep it manageable because I do have a full time job as well. Um, but when I was a teenager, I I knew that I I wanted to be involved in the horse world in a big way. But I also had other professional interests too. Um, I've always been like had a love of writing. It took me sort of in a creative kind of marketing uh, path, um, and it never really occurred to me at the time that the two interests would be at odds ever. Um, I think I was much braver as a teenager. I wish I still had that. Um, but if you can just sort of hold on to that gumption, you can you can make it make it work. But I I did think in in my teenage years that I would do it in some sort of capacity. Um, I wasn't sure if I would do it immediately, but I always thought there would be a point in my life where I would I would be working as a professional in the in the equestrian world. And Colleen, similar to uh, what Jessica said, um, I had lots of opportunities growing up to be an equestrian professional. Um, and similar to what Nicole said, I guess I should have disclosed um, when I did my intro that I do have horse training clients um, and horses in full-time training with me. Um, I just keep it very small. I keep it less than three so that I can manage it um, with my full-time job. But uh, I was given lots of opportunities um, at a young age, starting at, I believe six is when I had my first sale horse, if you will, um, that I was in charge of showing and marketing and things like that. So um, I had a a lot of people that believed in me. Um, I had a lot of people that probably thought I was going to do equestrian as a profession, um, but I was blessed with some amazing parents that made it very clear to me that just because we're supporting you and providing you with opportunities does not mean this is what you have to do. Um, so ironically, volunteering in the horse world is what got me to the medical field. Um, I volunteered at a therapeutic horseback riding center down the street from my parents' house. And one of them very quickly recognized me from local competitions and said, oh, this kid can ride. And so I made an arrangement with them that I would come school all of the um, horses that were therapeutic riding horses at least once a week. They all got schooled by me. And then I got to observe the physical therapist and occupational therapist working with the handicapped kids. So that's kind of where I got on my path of sports medicine was working with that physical therapist. Um, and that was when I was in sixth grade. So to say growing up in my teenage years, I would say by the time I was in like eighth grade, I knew for sure I wanted to work in healthcare. Um, and that's kind of a benefit that I had of knowing what I wanted to do because I very quickly figured out how to have a couple side horses in training or sale horses. Um, I had a niche for getting the really problem bucking horses for some reason. Um, and um, so I would, find a way to balance school or my full-time job with a couple side gigs of horses. Um, so I figured out that balance very quickly um, between my two um, passions. So I was very lucky in that sense. Allison? Um, I think I was a bit conflicted, particularly in um, yeah, high school, college, and just after. I definitely loved riding, teaching, competing. But I also, uh, and, and after college, uh, for some time, I definitely was full-time in the horse world. Um, but I always felt there was still more that I wanted to do. I, I've always really loved school, I've loved especially the sciences. And I thought a lot about medicine, I thought a lot about research, um, but I also traveled a lot. and was really interested in the challenges that I saw in a number of the different countries um, that I visited. and. Um, Overall, I, I was always sort of struck by this feeling like I hadn't quite found my life's work yet. So I felt like I had to keep exploring what that was, but knew that I, it would be important for me to keep writing in my life. So while I don't have, there's no one here in Switzerland right now that I'm working with, I definitely have throughout my life kept um, particularly teaching, uh, teaching writing in my life as well. Um, so I, I then, I can talk a little bit more about what I've done, but really, pursued international development overall and international health from there. And uh, Alexa? So I actually started a little bit different than everybody. Um, I didn't want to be a professional and WIT in 2013 really was the, the turning point for that, that I decided, you know what, I love horses, 
but I don't want to be a professional because I don't want the stress, like this, something that I use to, to de-stress to then become my stress, you know, to pay the bills or to, you know, eat at the end of the day. Um, and that, so I, I went to school. That was always something that I was planning on doing, got my business and uh, marketing degree from a local college so that I could continue training and stuff. And then I went to, I graduated college early. Um, like I said, I value an education, but I did not really want to be in school. So I got done a semester early and then I went to Florida because the horse that I was riding at the time, we thought that was kind of going to be the make it or break it and getting to the Grand Prix because he was a, on a little bit of a ticking uh, time bomb. Um, and so I went to Florida again and Honestly, that trip to Florida is what made me become a professional uh, because I saw some things in Florida that I really wanted to do my part to, to change and be a part of mentoring youth and doing what I could to make a positive difference for those around me, um, youth coming up the ranks, and just really trying to be that positive light for people. So. Um, I still am holding true uh, to the fact, though, that I don't want horses to be my sole income. So I do work full time and only have a, a little, well, I shouldn't say a little, sometimes it gets a little unmanageable number of clients um, that keeps me going and uh, that I train on this side. But I, it is a nice balance to have so I can still enjoy the horses and um, also have something outside of it. Um, all of you, all of you, I believe went to college, uh, and did you, how did you incorporate riding in college or did you? And Nicole Del Giorno, I'm going to start with you. So you don't have to go after anybody else. <laughs> I asked for it. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I did, I did go to college. I went to the University of Richmond um, and double concentrated in marketing and international business and took two horses with me. So anyone who tells you that you, you can't take a horse to college, it's impossible. It's, it is possible. Um, you won't have much of a social life, but it is possible. <laughs> so I, and I actually went away to school. So I, I moved to a different state um, and, and, you know, found, found a trainer, a training situation that I could work with. And uh, again, brought the two horses and um, continued competing. I think, you know, for, for me, I just tried to really schedule my classes in a way that I knew I would have blocks of time where I could be at the barn for four to six hours, um, five days a week. I, the, the facility that I was operating out of was uh, about an hour and a half away too from from my school um and i was you know sort of fortunate that there you know i i had a, a trainer that could support me too so if i had finals or something like that i think it is very nice if you're trying to do horses and school at the same time um, and you have the ability to do it to to work with with a trainer that can step in and ride if you're you, the last thing you want to think about is oh my gosh I have a qualifier and I also have finals <laughs> and that that situation will will happen to you I I recall even you know gosh it was I think almost 10 years ago now but um you know just be careful about your planning and and the workload that you're taking on on both sides um if in hindsight I probably shouldn't have taken the second horse <laughs> um it, it got a little bit overwhelming from time to time but you you can you can certainly do it um, and continue continue competing and also um, of course getting your education so yeah okay Nicole Galan yeah so I did bring my horse to college with me um, and where did you go to college I, I, I went to the University of Michigan okay um so i stayed in state for my school um it saved a lot of money in terms of not having to pay out of state tuition and that sort of thing um i will echo the sentiment that it's absolutely possible to bring your horse to college um and to do the parallel paths of investing in your horse career and investing in an education um however <laughs> it is absolutely difficult um the you know the social aspect of it um I 
didn't have much of a social life. Um, it was barn and school. Um, and it was, it was trying at times to take a step back and say, well, I may not compete much this year. I'll focus on training and I'll focus on school. That way I can be successful in both areas. Um, so it was a really um, difficult process to redefine success for myself. Um, so success became not going to a ton of competitions and winning a bunch of ribbons. It became really feeling fulfilled in my riding and then being successful and getting good grades in school. Super. Jess? Jessica? I know. I'm getting to the mute button. So, um, okay, let's see. So I went to uh, Scripps Women's College in Los Angeles and I rode my freshman and sophomore years. And um, for those of you who are familiar with Los Angeles, I used to drive an hour down the 10 five days a week, which is a big deal because traffic's terrible. Um, anyway, but I used to get up at five and drive and be there for a 7 a.m. lesson. Anyway, um, God bless my trainer. Um, anyway, so I actually found college dramatically less demanding in terms of time management. I was so overcommitted in high school that having a horse in college was kind of a walk in the park. Um, you know, I was so involved that it, it was not a difficult thing for me to do. And I found that um, it really helped keep me mentally very healthy. I didn't take my course my first semester and I came home in January to do a working student position in Canada, actually. And I told my parents, I was like, why are you punishing me for being able to manage my time well? Like, let me do this. And, and luckily they acquiesced. So. Um, I did get a horse my junior year, um, but he was injured before he got to me. So um, I was a working student over that summer while he recovered. So I didn't really pick up riding again until um, I graduated. But that was kind of my first experience with stopping riding and starting again and realizing that, you know, your muscle memory stays with you for a long time, even if you aren't actively riding. So good point. Uh, Alexa? Yeah, so I went to Albright College, which is about 25 minutes from me. Uh, when I was going through the college search process, I specifically applied to colleges that A, had good programs for what I was looking for, and then B, were close to barns <laughs> that I would want to train at. And I ended up staying at home because we have a farm here that I can ride and train out of. And it just was going to be uh, better for me financially to be able to then trailer to my trainer at the time who was about an hour and a half away. So I could do that once a week or twice a week and then continue training at home with the two or three horses that I was riding at the time. And as uh, Nicole said, it's really important to try to schedule your classes as best as you can so that you either, you know, you give yourselves chunks of time to be able to study and get the riding portion done. So I would either try to schedule all of my classes in the morning and then have all afternoon to ride and study, or you know, if I couldn't do that, schedule them in the morning and then have a big chunk of time in the middle of the day and just be kind of creative with that. Um, and then weekends were spent traveling to horse shows. I remember taking tests and writing papers and the tax stall at a horse show. That was kind of a usual occurrence uh, for me. So yeah, it's just, it's doable. It's not easy, but I think time management and uh, just your overall determination really can make a difference. Allison. Um, I grew up in Maine and it was very important to me to bring my horse and keep riding. And so I actually, I thought about going to school in California, but I couldn't imagine, I really loved the school, but I couldn't imagine driving back and forth across the country um, each time I needed to go back to school. So um, I, I also was looking for a place that would be convenient and also have the programs that I was hoping for. Um, I attended Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire, and I studied neuroscience. And I kept my horse at school at a nearby farm, and um, I didn't have um, a consistent trainer near me, so I had to sort of work hard at uh, having kind of a, a plan for myself and my horse over time, and then trailer to London, for example, which is about four hours away, um, when when possible, or when my horse was not well. I actually ended up driving 
on weekends to ride with London. Um, with uh, I was fortunate to have another horse to ride there. Um, I, I feel I really tried to treat my riding like a varsity sport, and I say that because I think that was one way that I was able to figure out how to balance it. I had a number of friends who were doing, who were runners, maybe you know, running for competitively for Dartmouth, and they had to do a lot of that management in terms of their schedules. And so I found ways to kind of learn from them. And um, I had then some kind of partners in crime in many respects. And I also applied um, for flexibility. I was on a trimester system, um, which meant that I needed to go for sophomore summer um, to Dartmouth, but they actually recognized that the summer was my competition time and they gave me a waiver from that summer. Um, and one other way that I can use riding to be connected to the school is that I um, coached the Dartmouth College um, dressage team. It was a small team, but it was an opportunity to kind of incorporate riding with also other students at school. Colleen? So I went to Quinnipiac University in Connecticut and I was very fortunate in my college search. Um, I was very adamant about picking top programs for athletic training and sports medicine, but I wanted an accelerated program. So conveniently for me, um, I had mentioned that I got homeschooled in high school. Um, I had moved in with my aunt and uncle for junior and senior year to train closer to Vicki. And um, Vicki was 15 minutes from Quinnipiac. So that worked out really well. I did not choose my college based on that. I can swear to you, I went to the best possible school um, for athletic training. Um, but I kind of had a different experience going off to college um, than most of you in the sense of um, I wanted to take my horse. I wanted to keep my horse there. Um, and senior year of high school, uh, the week the junior team was announced, uh, duet tore her deep digital flexor tendon. So that kind of just straight up threw me into taking a break from riding. Um, I think everyone thought it would be a very healthy break for me. It was not. My grades were the worst they ever were in my life. I was not working as a working student. I was working on campus. So I like literally never left Quinnipiac. Um, it was terrible. It was honestly awful. Um, so that whole, I didn't have a social life thing. Turns out that worked in my favor. Um, it helped me manage my time very well. Um, I only knew busy. I only function on busy. Um, so my grades, my grades went back up when I got her back. Um, but that break from riding, similar to like somebody else said, um, like you don't lose the they, muscle memory. Some of the hair sticks. And you don't. I'm leaving them to try. So the oh, uh, we have someone who needs to mute. I'm trying to find okay. you, Natalie. Coming with a pony, Natalie. Can you mute yourself? There you go. There we go. Okay. <laughs> okay so so um, I I was very privileged that uh, Margaret Freeman actually let me ride her horse Wendy a couple times um, just because I was literally going insane, um, not seeing a horse. I went from growing up with them in my backyard to literally no horse contact for a whole semester, um, and no car to even get to Vicky's. To eat, like. It was terrible. Um, so uh, going into sophomore year, um, you know, I couldn't sit around with downtime. So I got my EMT certification while I was bored without a horse. Um, and so that was kind of, like I said earlier, the start of me not being a working student and my job to pay for my horse was finally an outside source of money. Um, so I was crazy. I don't recommend what I'm about to say I did. I worked 40 hours a week on the ambulance overnight. I was taking 22 credits. I was training do a full time and I had 40 hours a week of athletic training clinical to do. So I was working 80 hour work weeks, riding my horse and taking 22 credits. Um, there was a lot of coffee involved and a lot of cumulative sleep on Tuesdays. Um, that was the day I didn't ride and I didn't have clinical. Um, then again, life just threw a curveball at me and um, my horse tore her deep digital flexor tendon again going into senior year, um, which was probably for the best. That was her forced retirement as a 12 year old um, in our I-1. Um, and I tore my ACL not even a couple months later. So it really slowed me down. It took away my horse. 
Um, and then it took away my job because I couldn't lift patients anymore. Um, and so my college experience was a roller coaster to say the least, but I can honestly tell you the best thing that happened um, was similar to, uh, I forget who said it, but my trainer sat me down and had a very realistic conversation with me. I think it was Nicole Gallant that said it and was like, listen, Young Riders is probably not the best thing to do. We did it sophomore year and competition season just always conflicted with finals and it was hard. Um, you know, so she kind of gave me the option. She's like, do you want to do your last year Young Riders or you want to train to I1? Um, so we did that and that was great and I don't regret a single minute of it. Um, but there's a lot of decisions that need to be made and I don't think that's anything new for any kid in the horse industry, if you will. Um, there's always tough decisions. So um, just pick what's important to you and, and balance it for a little bit and know that it's temporary and that it'll always be there to come back to. Did I miss anybody? I think that was everybody. Um, in hindsight, and you may not have anything to answer here, don't feel pressured. In hindsight, what did you learn from your horse sport involvement that has been valuable in your life today? Anyone want to start with that? <laughs> okay, Jess, I'll start. Surprise, it's me. Jess, Jess um, starting. She beat you. Yeah, sorry. Um, so I think, you know, one of the things that was super interesting for me is, you know, I left the equestrian industry without a plan. I just knew I had to leave and I was in a position financially that I was able to do that for a couple months and figure out what I was going to do next. But one of the kind of pervasive thoughts for me is I was like, I'm just a horse trainer. I don't have any transferable skills, which I didn't even know what those were at that point in time, but I, I don't have any skills that are really applicable in the real world. And, um, you know, now uh, after a lot of work with various coaches and friends and going through um, multiple jobs at, at Nike. This is my third job in two years, uh, very exciting. And um, I now look and think, oh my God, I cannot believe how many transferable skills I have after working in the equestrian world. Um, I made a little list. So um, I am a small business owner, which obviously just understanding how a basic business functions. Um, I am a teacher, so I deliver global trainings on a regular basis now. Um, and I am highly skilled. I'm watching trainings that are being delivered by, you know, global companies and my training far, super, super, uh, far exceeds those trainings just because of my general comfort level with teaching. Um, I have incredible networking and collaborative skills. I used to run um, a very large summer camp. And so my ability to multitask and bring people in and align people to a common purpose, um, you know, again, it's a very interesting thing and not to sound like a total narcissist, but to me, you know, Nike is where the cool kids work, you know, and I'm one of the cool kids that I have skills that are above and beyond people who have been in the industry for years and years and years. And that's just like the weirdest thing for me to like reconcile. So, um, you know, my ability to write comms, conflict resolution skills, you know, after many years of handling very difficult clients, you know, um, and then, of course, my attention to detail, thank you, London, um, and Pony Club and all the other places that uh, drilled that ability uh, into me. You know, I'm famous for my note taking now, which I also give credit to, you know, I started scribing when I was 11 and I used to go to horse shows just to scribe. So um, I am the official note taker just in general now. So, yeah, no, uh, there are so many different skills and uh, I don't think anybody should ever... Um, sell themselves short when making it when and if you make the jump. Jess, you mentioned you worked with coaches. Can you oh I'm guessing uh, other you're not talking about riding coaches? Not riding coaches. Um, okay. No, I, I'm talking about, you know, we have a variety of collaboration tools um, that we are um, either currently using or moving to. And so there's a lot of training as we teach people for example, actually, Zoom is a great example. So we just moved uh, Nike from Blue Jeans over onto Zoom, and so we had to teach everybody how to use this new platform. And so, you know, seeing the Zoom coaches, you know, seeing other platforms and how they're delivering trainings, you know, um, I'm not saying that they pale in comparison because they certainly don't, but I'm keeping pace. And that surprised me just because I think, like, 
oh, well, they're professionals, you know, they've been doing this, they were trained to do this, and Jess, I don't, yeah. Didn't you work with some sort of life coaches? Oh, That's oh, those meant. kind of coaches, yes, yeah. I apologize, I misunderstood. So, um, yes, so when I was making uh, the leap, I worked with uh, Jennifer uh, Verharn of Cadence Coaching, who was enormously useful in helping me um, kind of flip the script is what she calls it. So, you know, I was like, I don't have this. I can't do this. I don't want this. And she helped me think about things in terms of what I do want. So I really created a clear vision of the life that I wanted to lead without a job description attached to it, which really brought me to the place where I am now, where I feel like I'm really loving, living, loving and living up to my full potential and, um, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Spreading my wings. That's what I was going to say. That's it. Uh, Alexa, anything you want to add? Well, I like, I mean, Jess, you did a fantastic job hitting all of those points. And I think that's um, one thing that I've learned, you know, is that I am capable outside of it, but I actually want to take it from the other perspective, which is having the entrepreneurial business experience that I had prior to getting into training as a professional that really made such a difference as well because I felt like I could set some boundaries and run my business in a profitable way without it just being about the money. Um, and I think that's a skill that a lot of times full-time professionals will tend to not have. They might be great at teaching or they're great training horses, but then the business side of it isn't up to par. And that was one thing for me that I was really appreciative when I look back is that I was able to kind of match my riding skills with the business side of it as well, because I had that dual experience around the same time. So cool. Allison, anything? Um, yeah, I think I'm much better at what I do now because of my time as a writer and an instructor. I definitely am able to balance multiple responsibilities in a different way. I'm a, I'm a mom now, so I feel like in terms of, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not taking care of horses, but I'm taking care of children. It's definitely not 100% uh, transferable, but, uh, but definitely I have a lot of different things I'm managing at the same time. Um, I'm definitely much more resilient and I have a different level of perseverance, I think, within the work that I'm doing. I had a lot of highs and lows within riding due to my own health and my horse's health at different times. And I think I'm able to move forward in a different way. There are certainly different types of challenges in my work now, but I think I have a different perspective in, in doing that. Um, I worked as an instructor but also uh, myself, but then also an instructor in, a, in an education program for riding instructors. And that really helped me think about how people work and learn. And so I think I'm a much better manager. I've had quite big teams of very diverse um, types of people and I think I'm a much more effective manager and communicator because of that work that I, I did um, in teaching and, and thinking about how people learn. And I also work with ministries of health, um, government officials in lots of different settings and different cultures. And um, I worked in Nigeria and in Swaziland and in Laos, which were all very different settings. And I think I had many more skills and a much better understanding of how I could effectively support them to strengthen their health systems and do the work that they needed to do because I had worked with so many different types of people and types of horses, to be very honest. I think that you really learn different approaches and I think that's important in all the work that we do. Fantastic. Colleen? Yes, I think um, my job's unique because I do still work with athletes in my job and I consider us as equestrians to be athletes. And um, one of the major things that I personally have been told, um, and I'm sure all of you share the same quality from a young age, is that you're very mature for your age. And I think that comes from um, the fact that as equestrians, trainers, as we grow up, allowed us to have responsibilities and trusted us with those responsibilities. And there's not a lot of jobs out there that a 10 year old kid is trusted to go clean 80 saddles at London's for a weekend, you know, like, and no one's looking over your shoulder and no one's questioning, did you do it? 
it's just something that is told to you by your boss, if you will, to go do it and you do it. Um, and I think that's something that helped us mature a lot um, as young individuals. Um, and also just the fact that um, I've also been told a lot that I go above and beyond. You know, it's the little details, similar to what Jessica was saying, that, you know, the attention to detail. Um, let's be honest, as a working student or as a barn manager or any other position that you've had in the equestrian world, part of our job is to be vigilant and to look out for these horses as if they're our own. Um, and going above and beyond, that's just, that's just a part of the job. You know, um, it's, it's noticing that the gates open. It's noticing that the horse has a swollen hind leg or whatever it is. Um, and to me, that's just been second nature my entire life. I'd like to credit some of that to my parents because that's just their personality too. Um, but the, the extra step, not settling for what's expected of you, but going beyond that. Um, and I've actually been told by my boss here at Houston Methodist that I'm at a disadvantage when it comes to merit reviews, because now that he knows me well enough, my bar is here, whereas some other people's is here. Um, and he just expects me to do more because he knows that I, that's just me. Um, so I think all of those skills are transferable, but I also think that horses gave us the opportunity to kind of grow into that before we went out into our other careers. Um, and it shows that we were committed as young kids. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of athletes um, are committed and are driven, but are they given that responsibility and the, the ex expectation to go above and beyond and to be mature young adults? Super. Um, Nicole Belgiorno? Um, yeah, I don't know that I have a lot more to add other than what's been said. Um, and Jess, I, I agree with you. For some reason, I'm the best note taker at my company too. I don't know what it is, but apparently that is a transferable skill too. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know, but it, but it does. It gives you, you know, a, a sense of, definitely an innate sense of responsibility um, that I think every, uh, every equestrian worth their salt just has that tick to them that it's like, you're just, you're, you can be trusted with more responsibility than your peers because you, you are the person who's going to do the right thing. Cause you're used, like Colleen put it so beautifully, there are athletes out there then they're committed and they're driven, but we have this added responsibility of having to control our emotions and to uh, take care of another life from a very like early age. So I think, um, it, I think it, it does put you, um, put you at an advantage in, in comparison to your peers. The other thing is, um, you, you will know this very, you will notice it very early on in your working career outside of horses, that everyone who's listening that rides horses, you work harder than anyone else in the world. <laughs> because I don't know what it is, you, you can work 12 hours and not bat an eye, not realize time has passed. It's just something that I think we, we do. Um, and every single employer that I've, I've worked for has always commented on my work ethic. And I think that that's something that I learned through, through riding. Um, and it's something that will, that definitely put to use because especially when you're an intern, especially if you're in a competitive intern environment, that's what's going to, to set you apart. You'll be dealing with a lot of very smart people likely. Um, but some of those people will not be able to work as hard as you can <laughs> because you learn that from, from riding and from caring for horses. So um, I think that's, a, that's another thing that I really valued from, um, from being an equestrian growing up. I'm frequently referred to as relentless, and I think that is exactly <laughs> what people are used to, is that relentless pursuit of excellence. Yeah. They call me intense. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think I'm intense. <laughs> <laughs> By living in the South after being in Connecticut, that's big. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole world. Uh, Nicole, <laughs> Della, do you have anything to add? Um, I just absolutely echo the sentiment that as an equestrian, you're used to managing horses and taking on a lot of responsibility. And then when you get into the workplace, it's really easy to take on far more responsibility and manage that responsibility well. Um, especially in comparison to peers that are similar in age to you or similar in experience to you. 
Um, the other thing that I wanted to add that um, I didn't think got touched on was the um, the ability to learn how to learn. Um, and I think I, that's something that you get really good at if you become a good writer, um, is when you go into a lesson, you have a really good understanding of what you want to work on and you have a lot of authority and control over your own learning. Um, and you'll be a student for the rest of your life. Um, uh, you know, I, I always, when I was younger, I looked at older people and I was like, oh, they've got it all figured out. And the reality is that you learn perpetually. Um, so something that has paid off in dividends for me is the ability to come into a new situation at work and be able to sit down and know how to ask the right questions to get me to help understand something new so that I can go and take on that responsibility um, and be an effective um, employee. Super. Um, all of you listening, if you have any questions for the group or for anyone individually, you can write it down in the chat. Um, I have one question for Allison because you have two children. How, how old, <clears throat> excuse Nate. me, how old are Nova and Tate? So Nova just turned five on Sunday and Tate turned five, uh, three on Friday. So three wow. and five. <laughs> um, are they going to be introduced to horses? It's a great question. So when I was living in Maine and teaching Caroline in, in Maine, Nova came with me to a couple times when I taught and she was very interested and very excited. So I, and, and Tate is a big fan of horses. Anytime we pass by horses or, you know, visit a farm or something like that nearby. So I think that they, they will definitely want to venture into that. I think um, my husband Teo is, is hopeful that they don't love it so much yet, uh, <laughs> but uh, we will see. We will see where we end up. I, I hope they will. Um. Do you, and you're, I think you're the only one that isn't riding at all right now. Do you miss it? Yeah, I do. I think, you know, what's worked for me, I've had, I didn't see a horse at all when I lived in Nigeria. I didn't actually even put my, you know, my eyes never, never came across them. When I was in Swaziland, I had a chance to, to pop on my student's horse, Bob, every once in a while. And, uh, uh, and it, that was really wonderful. And then when I was in Laos again, I was pregnant for much of the time, so I didn't end up riding again because that would have been hard to take up in the middle of a pregnancy and what have you. But I um, I think it's always been really wonderful for me when it fits in really well in terms of the balance and it really enhances my life. I think I have a very intense job that feels a bit more like a lifestyle than a job sometimes, and that balancing that with my family and wanting to explore Switzerland and those types of things. For me, that's what feels right right now. But I know that there will be a time when that shifts a little bit. Maybe there's time that comes from my job or what have you when, when I will really um, want to take that on again. Um, so I think for me, I, what's been great is I've been able to come and go in and out of it. And when it fits well into my balance, then it's really enjoyable. Um. This isn't to be educational, but we have a group of people here who have such fascinating jobs. Will each of you share one weird little thing about your job that's kind of fun? <laughs> <laughs> or different? Just quick little something. Allison, you're on the screen. Do you have anything? Or do you want to wait oh, and think about it? I, I, need, I need a second to think okay. about that. <laughs> we'll, we'll start with Colleen then. Oh, good. Oh, maybe I, a little story of you treated somebody amusing or, or any, oh, you do rodeos. Back, yes. Horseback rider wise. This was the funniest moment. Of course, no one knows looking like this, that you're a horseback rider. Right. Um, and this guy got his boots stuck on, um, at rodeo and he, he was, I mean, he was trying everything in the training room. He was like basically breaking things. Right. And so I said, Hey, sit on the stool. I'll help you get it off. And he said, okay. And so I turned around, right? Because we all know how you get a boot off, right? I turn around and he goes, ma'am, do you know what I'm about to do to you? And I was like, yeah, no, like I'm a horseback rider. Like, let's go, let's get this boot off. And it was just really funny because they forget, you know, you forget when you look like this, that you're not a horseback rider. 
Now everyone at Rodeo Houston knows that I'm a horseback rider. Last year, some horse slammed its head on a cross beam getting out of the trailer. And it was day one, nothing was set up. They come running into the training room, not over to the vet's office, running into the training room. Colleen, we need your help. I'm like, oh my gosh, do I need an AED? Like what's going on? No, this horse has blood all over its face. We need your help. I'm like, so no, no matter where you go, you're the crazy horse girl. I mean. <laughs> Nicole Del Giorno? You're in a boring uh, business. I, I, I'm in a pretty boring business. Um, I, I truly, I, <laughs> I, compared to everyone else on the call, I think I'm like pretty pedestrian. Um, I mean, I, I work with some really cool organizations, which is, which is great. Um, I think especially with, we're all living through this pandemic right now, a lot of people are focused on uh, nonprofits and what they're, they're doing uh, for the world. Um, so a big part of what I'm doing right now is helping nonprofits make up for shortfalls, especially a lot of my clients are in the healthcare space. Um, so they actually, you would think that uh, in the healthcare space with all of the attention that's being put on hospitals, that they'd be pretty well off, that there would be donors sort of stepping forward to help them. Um, but donors assume that too. <laughs> so they need, you know, they sort of need help with their, their marketing at this time and being able to make a compelling case to big donors that can help them make up for some of the shortfalls that they're seeing. So not really a fun or interesting story, but definitely a rewarding part of my job right now. Um, and why I enjoy working for a company that really does have such a strong mission. And I knew it was something that I always wanted to do was to either enter the nonprofit space or work for a company like that. Um, that really had a strong social purpose. Um, so, so that's, I guess, my somewhat interesting thing. <laughs> no, that's great. Nicole, go on. I don't know if I have any like funny anecdotes that are funny for non-engineers. Um, I don't <laughs> think you guys laugh about swapping fuse plugs. Um, but uh, I mean, I love my job. I love my job to pieces. Um, I, the sense of pride that is in both my own heart and that of my coworkers when we get to see the technology that we build work. Um, there's just, there's nothing quite like it. It's, it's really, really satisfying um, in a way that I never really anticipated um, it being. I just, you know, I thought it would be something cool that I could do that's not horses. And in reality, I found a passion that I, I didn't even really no existed before getting into the industry um so yeah fantastic um jessica have you informed nike yet that they owe me billions of dollars because i had the phrase just do it long <laughs> before they did except for me it was usually just shut up and do it <laughs> <laughs> i'll make sure to pass that along you pass that on to them <laughs> I will, i'll make sure yeah for sure i don't know in terms of like really weird things per se um I think maybe just a surreal experience I'm having is um, in 2014, I had um, equine coronavirus hit my barn and burn through my entire facility. And so having managed a equine outbreak, it's kind of uh, interesting being um, on a team that is responsible for the uh, technological enablement of the Nike workforce and um, what that kind of insight has brought into how we support people uh, during this time. So I'm not really weird, but cool. I don't know. Cool. Uh, Alexa? Um, I think one thing that's kind of cool for me that I never thought I would get to do is um, part of my job is to uh, buy and sell different materials. And there's all different, you, know, you have aluminum, copper, brass, stainless steel, but there's a a bunch of different components to that. So I have this fancy little gun that I get to walk around with and I basically shoot x-ray beams <laughs> into different metals and it gives me the elemental composition. And um, so that's kind of cool. Like a lot of customers are like, whoa, what's that? Like, is that some high tech space gear? Um, but it's not, it, it obviously, it's, it just shoots x-rays at things <laughs> and tells me what it is. <laughs> um, yeah, and then the other cool thing is uh, without this job, I wouldn't have met my fiance. So I'm very thankful for that too. <laughs> okay, good. And uh, Allison? Um, I think in, in the work that I've done, um, I've just always been impressed by what I've been 
tasked with doing or what I've been allowed to do. You know, I, when I first got to Swaziland, for example, they said to me, we need to figure out how many uh, antiretrovirals we need to treat HIV this year in the country, in the whole country. And I was going to be responsible for figuring that out. And, you know, for me, I said, who am I? How could I do that? But I think I've learned that if I'm really, you know, if you're really passionate and you're really committed to doing the best that you can do and asking the questions you need to ask and really just putting your head down and applying all those skills we've talked about um, to the work that's at hand, then you really have an, can have an opportunity to impact pretty amazing things. I'm fascinated at where you're sitting because it looks like if you stand up, you're going to fall down into the basement or whatever. I'm at a, a stand-up desk with all of my oh. husband's IT-related uh, okay. things behind me. So I, don't worry, I, I'm safely, firmly on, on the ground. <laughs> Well, we've, we, we're exactly at an hour, which is what our plan is. I want to thank you all very, very much. This has been fascinating. Allison, thank you for staying up so late. Jessica, thank you for interrupting your midday. We're covering quite a range of, of uh, space here. And uh, best of luck to you all. Hope I'll see you all soon. Thank Great you. Bye, everybody. Thank, thank you so you. much. Bye. Bye-bye.